I know I said I might not say thank you to the elders, um, but I do say thank you. It was this uh, process of studying to present something for you guys is something that we all should probably do because when you stand up here, you might know the story and you might think you know where it says it in the story, but when you have to be up here, you fact check and double fact check and it's good for us and I do actually want to say thank you. Um, as we have started today, uh, we started with his birth, which was a little more lighthearted and it was a joyous thing to talk about. Josh then presented a beautiful lesson talking about his life, which was very impactful. Right now, we are going to talk about his death, which we'll find out is inevitable. And then Josh is going to wrap us up and we're going to talk about uh, his resurrection, which is everything. Uh, the first, we're going to do a combination of the Lord's Supper plus this talk, and we're going to split it up into two different parts. And the first one, we're going to talk about Jesus' death and mostly his uh, suffering of his body and his fleshly suffering that he goes through with the, when we talk about the bread. Uh, as you can see, uh, we started today talking about prophecies and the fulfilled prophecies. I know you guys probably can't read that, but there are a bunch of prophecies, and all of these are going to take place in a 24-hour period or less. Um, and it's going to go through all of the Old Testament prophecies and then all the fulfillments that will take place. We're not going to cover all of them, but as we talk about them, if if you guys want this slide, we can give it to you and you can look at it because it's pretty amazing. Uh, we're going to look at the, first we're going to look at what led up to the cross. Um, we're going to quick overview step by step. Uh, the first thing that we're going to talk about is when Jesus was in the garden. Uh, it's in Matthew 26, 36 through 46. Uh, we see that Jesus is praying in the garden. He takes some of his disciples with him and, and they go and they pray and he goes off by himself and says, hey, keep guard for the hours near. Um, he goes and prays to God. And he, multiple times, he says, God, can you let this cup pass for me? And then, knowing probably the answer already, he also says, not my will, but your will be done. Um, just like Josh mentioned, he's a selfless Lord that we should be glad to have. And he knew what eventually was going to take place. But he still went to his father in prayer to see if there's another way because he knew just how uh, bad the suffering that he was going to have was going to be. Uh, while he was praying, a couple he went back and saw the apostles and was like, hey, why are you guys sleeping? Shouldn't do that. Wake up, pray. And he goes and does it again. And this leads us up to uh, Matthew 26, 47 through 56, when Judas comes and kisses him on the cheek. Uh, he brought seemingly mostly uh, Jewish guards and, and, uh, and high priests, and they, they went to arrest him at night. Um, so Jesus was up praying. They go and they find him. And this is where Peter, uh, who said he would stick with Jesus till the end, draws a sword, cuts off the ear of one of seemingly a guard, um, Jesus then tells him to put your sword away. Whoever lives by the sword is going to die by it. And then he also tells him, and Blake uh, led the song, 10,000 Angels. He said, he, could he not pray for 12 legions of angels to come down? And God would grant that if that was um, to happen. Quick math here. Uh, 12 legions is somewhere between 52 and 6,000 soldiers are in a legion. So 12 times 6 is 72. Uh, we have an example in 2 Kings 19.35 that one angel killed 185,000 Assyrians. If you also think back in our first lesson today, all the angels appeared to those uh, individuals, maybe in a dream, maybe in person. Every one of them, I didn't mention it there, but every one of them uh, originally was fearful when they saw the angel appear to them. My guess is these angels are pretty strong. This 185,000 is, uh, the angel didn't die, so the 185,000 could keep going. But if you did some simple math, 
72,000 times 185,000, 13 billion. That's uh, 13 billion, 320 million, but that's four and a half billion more people than are currently on the earth today. If God wanted to, there was, there was about 170, 180 or million people on the earth when Jesus was born. He's pretty much saying, with some simple math and some stretching, I could destroy the earth 78 times over if I wanted to. But I'm not going to because, um, once again, Matthew 26, 29, we got to fulfill the prophecy. Um, so he's arrested. He's betrayed by his friend. Uh, and then we go to Caiaphas and the council. The whole time uh, he's going there, most likely, I mean, the Jews that arrested him didn't like him. So they put him in chains. They probably beat him the whole way there. Uh, but he goes there, and in Matthew 26, 57 to 68, it talks about false witnesses coming to them, or coming up, and they mock him, and they spit on him. Um, but the whole time, Jesus remains silent. Um, we're going to get into more imagery, but like a lamb to the slaughter, Jesus is going to remain silent. Uh, next... They didn't have the authority, it didn't seem like, to kill him at the time. And it's one of their Jewish laws that they couldn't do the killing of a fellow Jew, I guess. Um, so they had to go to Pilate. In Luke 23, 1 through 7, they went to Pilate to be like, hey, we can't kill this guy, but you can because you're a Roman. Would you do that for us? Um, Pilate looks at him. They talk for a little bit. He finds no guilt in him. Um, and then he finds out that he's from an area where Herod has jurisdiction. So he says, hey, send him to Herod. They go to Herod. Herod's actually excited. So in Luke 23, 7 through 11, Herod is excited that Jesus is coming to see him because he's never met him. And he thinks that this could be an opportunity where he gets to see, uh, he gets to see a miracle or, I don't know, something, something impressive to happen. When Jesus doesn't do any of that, his soldiers mock him. Uh, they, they actually put nice clothes on him, and they march him out back to Pilate again. So once again, all this is happening, in a, keep your, your mind framed, in a 24-hour period. He's going from place to place to place, walking, probably in chains, probably getting beaten and spit upon along the way. And all of this is just the deterioration of his body. Uh, the second encounter that he has with Pilate, is, it takes place in Luke 23, 13 through 25. Uh, so Pilate saw that the multitudes kept, they, they were growing, the mob was growing a little bit. Uh, he then uh, remembers, maybe thought about it the whole time, but he remembers that there's a tradition where the Romans release a prisoner. And they're like, uh, let's release Jesus, but he, he seems fine. And they say, no, we want you to release a known insurrectionist and a murderer, Barabbas. Um, and then he does do that. And then once again, the crowd cries out, as we were singing right there, crucify him. It wasn't good enough that they were going to whip him. And we'll get into some of that later. But they wanted him to die. And I think that's... That was part of the fulfillment, but that was that's the end goal. Um, so some of the physical suffering that Jesus would have gone through, not only walking a lot uh, back and forth from powerful person to powerful person and having a mob probably around you, mocking you and spitting on you, um, but Roman tradition, all the crucifixions, Pilate eventually... I skipped that part, but Pilate uh, eventually says, hey, I don't find guilt in, in Jesus. I'm going to wash my hands of his blood. And all the Jewish people said, we will willingly take on the blood of Jesus on us and our children. And he said, well, I'm washing my hands of this. I don't, it's not on me, but you guys do what you want. And so he did eventually order the Romans to uh, carry out the execution. Uh, typical execution started with a flogging or a scourging. Uh, so crucifixion, according to most historians, started in Persia. That's 
pretty much modern day Iran, uh, which then Alexander the Great took over them, and then they gave it to the Carthaginians, and then we all know that Carthage and well, maybe uh, the Carthage and Rome fought a battle, so now the Romans have it. But the Romans perfect things, and that's why we know about them through history. So some of this stuff that we'll get into, um, the Romans might have made it a little better than the common, the common thought of uh, normal crucifixion. Uh, the scourging took place. They tie, they tie Jesus up to the post where his back's exposed. Uh, they get a whip. The whip is made to cut through the skin. Then they put iron balls on it. The iron balls are made to bruise your muscles. And then they put sheep bone on there. The sheep bone is, or they could have uh, lead spikes, but those are made to get in you and then rip your skin off. All of us would be so lucky in our life if we had a mom, a dad, a friend, a spouse that would have our back. Sometimes we don't come to Jesus when we should. He gave us back for us. Uh, the next thing that we go to, Jesus uh, carried his cross. So in John 19, 17, uh, we read about him taking his cross to the place of the skull for uh, Golgotha. Um, some people do say that he carried the whole cross. That's fine. Uh, the tradition would actually have, um, it's called a stipe. That's the, the upright position. Most people would say that's permanently in the ground. Uh, but if, either way, Jesus was to carry his cross or uh, at least the crossbar of his cross, which they say weighed between 75 and 125 pounds. And they made sure that they did the flogging, which seems uh, intense enough to not want to be seen by people. But they do the flogging inside the city and then they make people that are being crucified and Jesus walk out of the city because it's too intense for people to see. Um, so he walked over to the distance between where the flogging probably took place and where he walked on top of, of uh, Golgotha was about 2,000 feet. So he walked over a fourth of a mile with a cross, um, at least the bar, carrying it that way. We know that uh, it was prophesied that he fell under the cross and then they had to get uh, Simon the Cyrene to help him carry it. Yeah, right. Um, the rest of the way. And that would make sense because if you think about all that's gone, that's happened so far, he's working on little sleep, got scourged, he's been beaten. He also, at this point, has a crown of thorns on his head because of the Roman soldiers mocking him. Uh, and the, the point that you can see in the picture uh, they, they tie your arms up and make you carry it that way. So when you do fall, there's nothing to stop a 75-pound log crushing into the back of your head when you have a uh, crown of thorns on your head. Um, like I said, I think that the Romans probably perfected the practice of crucifixion. A lot of historians think so. Um, so in the picture, it shows the nail going through the wrist area. In the Bible, it often says hand. I'm not, I'm not telling you one way or another. I, I, don't, I think it matters, but I don't think it matters for our salvation because Jesus died, and that's the main thing, and then we're going to find out he raised us from the dead. But um, they, a lot of historians think that the Romans perfected this practice, so the Persians and Greeks and Carthaginians probably put, this is a seven inch nail by the way, not as big as the one that was used uh, because as you can see on the, the top, it would have a bigger top plate and it's probably about three times this size. But they would need the length of this and back in the day, it sounds like the Carthaginians and those people put it through the wrist because it would support the body weight a little more. Um, but come to find out if they put it through the hand then there's a nerve in the hand that the Romans seemingly found out about 
And when you use your hands to push up off the cross in order to breathe, even more pain. Um, but this nail, not this one, but the nail would be driven through his hand or wrist um, without breaking a bone, which is critical because that's a fulfillment of the prophecy. Your bones in your hand and your feet are actually round. So if you were to go through it, it would separate your bones so that uh, they wouldn't break. And then they would go all the way through the crossbar, and they'd hit it on the backside, but it would stay in place. Uh, they would do the same thing to the feet. Most likely, they overlap them. You can go through both feet without breaking a bone, because once again, uh, they are uh, round bones that you can get through. Uh, eventually, though, how you would die... Um, kind of goes back full circle to what we talked about with the whale eventually you die of suffocation when you can't you can't fight anymore you can't fight the pain of pushing off to come up for more air when you're when you're suspended like that you're they believe you get shortness of breath so you can't take in a full a full breath so people would have to push off their feet and push off their hands to go up for air and eventually you would, you would tire out, and eventually Jesus did, and, uh, and then he took his last breath uh, that way. There were, during the crucifixion, there were two drinks that were offered to him. In Mark 15, 23, they offered him wine mixed with myrrh. This was typically done by the women of the city um, for people that were going out and getting crucified. The, the reason for the drink was uh, so the victims could have a mild painkiller. Jesus refused it. Jesus wanted and uh, fulfilled prophecy, but also wanted to bear all of the pain that he did on the cross. Well, he didn't want to, but he did it for us. And then uh, the second drink that was given to him was in John nineteen twenty nine. It says a jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it and put it on the stalk of a hypsis plant and lifted it to Jesus' lips. The reason this is uh, important is because the hypsis plant was also, the stalk was also used um, to apply the blood that went over the doors for the Passover. Um, and as we know, Jesus is our Passover lamb. So we're about to pray for the bread. As you guys are thinking about the, the, the bread, I want you to really think about um, all the physical pain that Jesus went through on the cross for you and me. Let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Most gracious Lord and loving Heavenly Father, we're so humbled, Father, that we have the opportunity to approach you through prayer. And so, for you, thank you, Father, for all your love and your blessings and your mercy. Father, we're so mindful of your love that beyond our understanding that your son would come and die on the cross of Calvary. We pray, Father, as we partake of this bread, this unleavened bread, that we realize, Father, remember, Father, that it was thy precious body, sinless body that was hung on the cross for us. We pray, Father, as we partake of the Father, that you'd help us to clear our mind of anything else and remember the sacrifice of thy son on the cross of Calvary. And we pray, Father, that as we partake of it, that we would take it in a manner, in a way, an attitude that is pleasing and acceptable unto thee. For we ask all this in Christ Jesus, your son and our Savior's most precious name. Amen.
I was just thought about the physical suffering of, of Jesus on the cross. Um, and we went through the timeline of what, what led him to get to, to, to be on the cross. Uh, I have a question. As we, as we think of other, uh, maybe a more of emotional side of what Jesus might have gone through, I have a question. Who would you have been? Uh, the first option would be the Pharisees. Uh, would you want to be someone that, that keeps their power, that keeps their tradition? Um, are you you're scared of change? You, you want to keep the old law? Um, you, you, maybe you just don't see what's right in front of you, and maybe you're bloodthirsty. Maybe you want to be the one that kills Jesus. My guess is we're all here because we love Jesus. I don't think that's any of us, but we might share a few of the same characteristics, unfortunately, as some of, some of the Pharisees that, that plotted to kill Jesus. Would you have been the Roman soldiers? Um, they made a mockery of truth. Uh, they, they're the ones that put the crown of thorns on his head and not just placed it there, pushed it there. They beat him with a rod on there, and they put him in some, some uh, nice clothes so they could mock him. Is that, is that us? I, once again, I doubt this one. You're going to volunteer to say, yep, well, I'm a Roman soldier. That's me. But I do think sometimes we see bad things in the world happening, and we, we're unwilling to, to stop the mockery. Um, or would you be the mob? Would you, are you the person that goes along with what other people are telling you? Um, you want to just go with the flow? You're okay with with watching destruction happen, as long as it's not you. Are you pilots? So this one, I was talking with April, this one resonates with me a little bit, hopefully not too much. Um, it seemed like Pilate wanted to do the right thing. Pilate didn't want to kill Jesus. He found no fault in him. But Pilate knew if there, were too, if there was too much insurrection in the land, then Caesar was going to look at him, and he was going to be the one in trouble and it might be his life or his job at stake. And sometimes I think we want, we have good intentions, but are we willing to lose anything for them? Um, would you be the apostles? Um, it says that they scattered. Well, they, they scattered uh, when they were in the garden and they came to arrest Jesus. Obviously, we have um, some of them stayed and fought. I guess Peter stayed and fought for a smidge, but uh, he ultimately left. But the rest of the apostles, they were there in good times, but when they faced danger, they scattered. Um, would you be like Peter? I think a lot of us actually would, I relate to Peter too. A lot of us relate to Peter. Um, it seems like Peter talked a good game. He said, I'll, I'll be with you. I'll die with you. I think we would do that too. I think if, if you said, hey, there's a mob coming and they're not going to let you, you live unless you fight, I think all the guys in here, probably most of the women too, we'd fight, take a bullet for someone. Feels fine, not the bullet would, but the idea sounds doable until your wind condition of Jesus says, no, we're not going to fight, and the mob surrounds him. Then... Are you going to be like Peter and deny him? Uh, but just like Peter, I think oftentimes after we do that, I think we find ourselves weeping because we're frustrated with the choices we've made and we feel sorrowful. And I think Peter's a good example of that. Um, would you be the few that actually stayed near the cross? So we, we know that his mother was nearby. Um, pretty sure other Mary was there nearby as well. Uh, it sounds like the, the one that Jesus loved was there. Would you be there for Jesus? Um, yes, they could not stop what was happening, but their presence would help what was being done to him. Um, or would you be like Joseph of... Uh, <laughs> I was working on it back there. I can't say that word. Uh, well, you know what I'm saying. Or Nicodemus, who after the death, boldly, and, and I say boldly because it is bold, they said, hey, can we bury the body? And that's bold because 
then people would know they're associated with Jesus. And we don't, we don't know until later that Peter was associated with Jesus. The, the mob doesn't know that. He denied him. These people, after um, his death, boldly uh, stepped up and said, we want to bury him. Uh, the next thing, no matter who you pick right there, it doesn't matter. I mean, it does. We want to live our, we want to live for Jesus. But in this scenario, it didn't matter which one you were because he died for all of them and he died for all of us. So going back to the garden, um, before the arrest and before um, anything, we have an understanding that Jesus was sweating blood. So this is a, it's a real medical thing. I'm sure these people over here probably know what it's called. I saw it, but I couldn't say it just like I couldn't say Arimathea. Got it. Um, but that's a real thing. And uh, I do think that Jesus would have been stressed enough on the physical side of things. He knew he was going to get beaten. He knew the mockery was coming. He knew the thorns and the nails were going to be placed on his body. He knew he was going to get whipped and scourged. And then he knew he was eventually going to die. But I think there's more to it. Um, I want you guys to think about the worst sin that you ever had. How'd that make you feel? How did it hurt the ones around you? How long did it take to get through that sin? Maybe you're still getting through that sin. How much shame did you feel? How much guilt did you feel? Uh, I think... I think the most powerful thing is that Jesus took on all of that sin. Now, the imagery is pretty, pretty real. Um, in Matthew 27, 45 and 46, it talks about there being darkness for the three hours that he was seemingly on the cross. And he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We sang the song that says, or God turned his face away. Don't know if that's literal it, but the idea that taking on this much sin could lead us to believe that he's might turn his face away should tell you just how powerful jesus taking on all of the sin was for all of us now we're gonna pray for the for the cup and the 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 blood that was shed for us Let's go to our Heavenly Father again in prayer. Most gracious Lord and loving Heavenly Father, we're so very thankful and so blessed beyond our understanding in so many ways. We're especially thankful, Father, that your Son was willing to die on the cross of Calvary, first by his body, but also by shedding his blood. We pray, dear Lord, Father, in this time that as we partake of this fruit of vine, which represents thy Son's blood, willingly shed on the cross for our sins. We again pray, pray, dear Lord, Father, that we would take it in a manner and a way that is pleasing unto you. For we ask all this in Christ Jesus' name. Amen.
This concludes the Lord's Supper. The next song we'll sing will be Christ Arose. song before, final lesson will be Rabbi and I. If it's convenient, would you please sing?
We studied quite a bit about the resurrection in the adult class this morning, which was nice because I'm, there's a lot of material that I'm not going to cover. Um, I really just want us to focus on the actual event of the resurrection and how that took place. And um, the song we just sang, Rabbi and I, it's, it's about the resurrection. Do you know the actual story that inspired that song? It's found in John chapter 20. And if you will turn there with me to John chapter 20. We're going to read the whole chapter, and bear with me. It's, it's not very long, but it's going to be about half of our lesson, so you're going to have to put up with it for too long. John chapter 20. I'm reading from the New King James, beginning of verse 1. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. She ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter, therefore, went out and the other disciple and were going to the tomb. So they both ran together, and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. And stooping down and looking in, he saw the linen cloths laying there, yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb, and he saw the linen cloths lying there, and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who came to the tomb first, went in also, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again to their homes. But Mary stood outside by the tomb. I didn't know this was going to be this hard just to read this chapter. <laughs> but Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting. One at the head of the other. One at the head. And the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said, because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know it was Jesus. And he said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? And she, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where they have laid him. And I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him, Rabbi, which is to say teacher. And I can imagine right there, she might have tried to go and embrace Jesus. But he says, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father. And to my God and to your God. Mary came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord. And that he had spoken these things to her. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled, for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst of them and said, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now Thomas, called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. So he said to them, Unless I see the hands of Unless I see on his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, the disciples were again inside. It seems like a long time to wait after seeing that Jesus has been resurrected and to try to convince someone that you've seen him. And he's, for, for eight days, y'all are waiting around wondering, is, is, is Jesus going to show up again? And uh, so after eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. 
Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here and look at my hands. Reach your hand here and put it to my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. And we talked about in the adult class today, and in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, the Apostle Paul states that Jesus was witnessed after his, resurrection by over, by, after his resurrection by over 500 people. And the fact that he lived, that he died, that he was buried in the tomb, and that he was in fact resurrected is undeniable. Jesus lives. And so I want to bring the lesson full circle back to where we began. And uh, in summarizing everything that we talked about today, I decided to let the scripture do the talking. So if you'll turn to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. We'll read verses 1 through 4. And this is from the ESV. Hebrews 1, 1 through 4. A long time ago, many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high having become much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. So we've tried to keep everything focused on, on Jesus today from the prayers and the songs and our lessons. And, and I hope this has been a refreshing experience for everyone here that's a Christian to be really focusing on our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And if you're not a Christian, I, I really hope today has proven why you should be. I hope that you're motivated Remember the Samaritan woman from the first lesson? Jesus told her that whoever drinks from the water that he would give, they would never thirst, but it would have a spring of water welling up to eternal life, John 4, 14. And Jesus talked more about that water when he told Nicodemus in John chapter 3 that one must be born again. He said that one must be born of the water and the spirit to enter the kingdom of God. And Jesus talked more about that water in Mark 16, 16, when he said, Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. In Romans chapter 6, we have an example of baptism. The Apostle Paul explains how it works. It brings us into contact with the blood of Christ. When we go down into the water, we die to ourselves, just like Jesus died on the cross. And we're buried with Jesus. And then we rise up out of the water. We're resurrected with Jesus, leaving behind our old life, leaving behind our sins. and Just the way that Jesus left behind the linen wrappings in the tomb. We have water prepared back here for anyone who wants to make that decision to become a Christian. You can do that right now by stepping up to the front. Or maybe you've got some questions you want to talk about it. Please don't wait. After the service, come and talk to some of the members. We'd be glad to talk to you about how to make your life right and, and put on Jesus and baptism and how to serve him. So let's stand together. We'll, we'll sing the song of invitation. Jesus, strong.